Thanks, Roland. That's a great introduction. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I'll, 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 I'll step you through, actually, a lot of those little clips you just mentioned. Um, I'll step you through the, the background to this, this journey um, uh, and, and explain a bit you know, where it all came from. Because unlike some of the questions I typically get from the press, did I sort of wake up one morning, bang my head, and, and think I had to build an Ironman suit? That genuinely wasn't the starting point. The starting point was really a vision around, um, could we approach the challenge of... Um, of flight in a subtly different way. So for a hundred and odd years, we put human beings inside flight vehicles, you know, um, helicopters, aircraft, and that's worked pretty well. Could you, for no other reason than just the hell of it, to see whether it's possible, because the conventional wisdom was suggesting it's not possible, could you augment the already pretty capable human mind and body with just the right amount of technology and see whether you could achieve flight in that way? As I say, the, the reason was purely just taking on a challenge that was considered to be, you know, pretty, pretty impossible, and I, you know, in my free time, I like uh, to take on those kind of challenges. So I've got a little clip here from, um, uh, this is uh, actually just down the road where I used to work in Canary Wharf. This is uh, a chap who's brilliant at doing this calisthenics training. I think this is just if you, know, you need any excuse to show how capable the human body is. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah? If, you, if you focus the human mind and body as a system on training to, uh, you know, to deliver some, sort of, some specific outcomes, in this case, pulling off a planche move, you can see the leverage through his shoulders is horrendous. So, that's the machine that I wanted to then go and augment. And the other thing I should mention is that what's fueled this journey, apart from the, the, you know, the passion to go after this vision, was a very strong belief in trying to repurpose existing technology and adapt and improvise and get out almost the same day as you have the idea and try and test stuff. I, I, it's kind of the anti or the antithesis of sitting there desk studying the hell out of stuff because that tends to lead you down a direction of conventional wisdom. If you get out there and test and make your own learnings, it can really get you to a different place. So ground zero for us, I suppose, was that. Um, that was a little micro gas turbine. Because when I say about augmenting the human mind and body, it, fa it became fairly obvious fairly quickly that the kind of uh, solution to augmenting the human, human being with thrust was going to be gas turbines. Their power to weight ratio is phenomenal. That little guy there is about two kilos and puts out 22 kilos of thrust. So we got hold of one of those. And this is back in February 2016 and built that extremely over-engineered arm mount for fear of exactly what this was going to be like. We'd obviously bench tested them before, but no one had really got near these things. And actually, we don't have a film, unfortunately, of actually testing it for the very first time with that arm mount because everybody was so somewhat blown away by, uh, by the experience. What we do have is the test literally about three days afterwards where now we've got ourselves a tube. Stick your arm in. When I said about trying to work out what it is you can, you know, go and repurpose to test a theory. Well, it worked really well with that massive arm mount, but why not go and get a mop bucket and put the fuel tank in that, and then aluminium tube with your fist in it, bolt it to there. You've still got a little servo tester for those, you know what those are, on the inside of the arm, and as you can see, it was blowing the heads around quite convincingly. So, check. Um, so th this was now a fuel tank in a backpack, field, and me jumping around with one on each arm. And I always like pointing out the lady in the background that was quietly doing some allotment work. <laughs> And then she, it's very British, she just sort of quietly looked up and thought, well, that's unusual. So you can see that's around 44 kilos of thrust. You get some idea of the power, because I, I didn't do a very good job of trying to hold that out. Anyway, that worked, that worked really well. So there's only one place to go from there. If that's two engines, I wonder what four's going to be like. <laughs> you, can, you can very much see, I mean, yeah, I'm not coming down very quick, yeah? <laughs> Um, so you can very much see the sort of R&D nature of all those things strapped to the arms, uh, all the electronics and everything. We must have slaughtered hundreds of thousands of zip ties in the la this last 18 months. Uh, but you can see that's, you know, starting to prove quite compelling. Um, and really the journey just carried on. And this is now sometime, let's say, Easter 2016, uh, making pretty quick progress in evenings and weekends. This was a nice experiment to try and think, well, it would be nice to have something that would stop you falling over if you had, if you had a mistake. Um, the, the, photog the, the film person backed off a bit here, um, it, but it didn't work at all. We, uh, we had a, you can see we've got the engines down on the legs now, and yeah, it just didn't work really very well. The learning there was that actually it, it's hard enough to balance four thrust vectors as it is, but if you've got a fifth one that also now is varying in terms of strength and direction depending on where you're dangling from it, that proved impossible. So we canned that and carried on sticking with me just trying to not fall over, but I did fall over quite a bit, as you'll see in a minute. Um, so this is now two engines on each arm and one on one leg because we had one in maintenance and then I pinched a fuel line and then the learning from failing thing, there, there, there's, there's a learning from failure. Um, 
and that should have been, as I say, one on each leg, but we had one in maintenance, and I remember the decision, which was that should we just wait another couple of weeks for that to come back, or should we just try five and just try to hold it under the center of gravity? Yeah, let's do that. And that was working all right. It was the pinch fuel line that stuffed that up. Um, I think there's a nice blind alley here. I always like to think this is a sort of evolutionary tree. This is like sort of Darwinian dead end. This is putting three on each arm. So that's now about 10 kilos of engines on each arm, pushing with about 70 kilos on each. So if I put them on full power, I would have left the screen. And we also had a problem with the heat circulating around the batteries. So we put them up on the shoulders, which looked ridiculous. Anyway, as another, you know, that, that took a few days to put together. Go try it, test it, learn it. You know, learn that it wasn't a very good idea. But we made some pretty good uh, progress. And this is still with this format with the um, engines on the legs. Uh, the logic there was that, you know, your legs are pretty strong devices designed to take load. So that bit was sensible. You see, we get really close here now. That, would, that bit was sensible. The problem was, as you saw at the end of that little clip, my leg just kicking up. There's a weird human behavior where if you fall off a bridge or a jump off, you know, off a pier into the water, people tend to cycle their legs. There's something innate in the human being that when you can't feel the ground anymore, you start feeling around for it involuntarily, which is fine until you've got a jet engine strapped to it. <laughs> in which case, it really starts throwing you everywhere. Anyway, we persevered and uh, this arrangement despite those challenges, um, actually achieved, got us to achieve the milestone I'll share with you in a second, which was November 2016. So this is only since March through to November, we went from that one engine in a lane through to this, which is still my favorite clip. Here we go, but watch the right leg. Look, I'm holding it, I'm trying to not flap it around too much. But there you go, that's six second first flight. You can tell by my face, I was rather chuffed with that. That is genuinely the moment when this went from a uh, you know, somewhat of an admittedly crazy project, which I didn't tell too many people about, and my wife tolerated. Uh, we spent an awful lot of time in this Wiltshire farmyard um, to um, uh, do all this testing. But at that point, I suddenly realised, oh my God, this actually works. So really, it was a, it was a, it was a, qu a case of refining the model from there. And I think falling over a lot as well as I think I've got. Here we go, falling over. Yeah, that, that, was, um, that was another learning about fuel tanks. We had three at that stage, and the middle one at the back, you can see, looks suspiciously flat. Uh, that got drawn, you know, the, the fuel got drawn out of that one twice as quick as the other two and there was a tiny bit of air in the top of it and guess what, air into the gas turbine and we lost one engine and <laughs> fell on the floor, so we don't do that again. Uh, and also I'm still flying there with, um, actually no, I've got the two engines on my back. So what we did is, as I described the challenge with a leg on each, uh, with an, uh, an engine on each leg, um, aside from this kind of challenge of trying to stop your legs wobbling around, it also was so close to the ground, you could actually watch on full power the gas turbines, given the exit speed of the air is 1,000 miles an hour, you could see them actually digging, chipping away at concrete. So it really limited where you could take off from. They don't show you this in the Iron Man film. Um, so what we did is essentially just move them gradually up the body and they ended up settling around your waist. So you've really now got a very stable setup. You've got an engine there, engine there, two there and two there. So if you draw a straight line out of each one, remember sort of GCSE physics vectors, you're actually a really stable kind of teepee unless you lose an engine, then it's not so stable. Um, and then I think the next clip is gonna be, uh, here we go, so this, this was that arrangement, and this was goofing around at an airfield. Uh, this is great fun, they actually shut the airfield down, it looks a lovely, lovely day, but it was really, really windy, and they, all the other aircraft got kind of, I don't know, shut in or whatever the phrase is, but we were still flying. We don't use wings, you see, not at the moment anyway, so uh, the wind really didn't matter, the thing creates more than enough <laughs> wind. But you can see, the stability and control is pretty, pretty neat there, and there's no gyros or ECUs. I can't ski or skateboard or anything. The, the, the thing, the suit, wants to be stable. And the way we ended up learning to, to control it was not with the throttles. The whole thing now is actually downstairs. It's just on one throttle, which, by the way, is a hammer drill trigger. You know, electric drill trigger. Turns out to be way better than anything else you can find. But <clears throat> very much in the spirit of just get on and repurpose what you can find today. Um, the, the way we've ended up learning to fly this is uh, with, with those vectors again. So you spool up the engines you, you, with the preset amount of power you need, hold them out, and as you can imagine, if they're all pointing this, you know, the arm one's pointing this way, then all it does is just squashes you inwards, doesn't, you don't go anywhere. All you do is start to bring them down, and then the vertical component of the thrust starts picking up, and until it equal, you know, equalizes with your weight, you then start lifting off. And then if you want to go forward, all you do is just tip forward. If you start to drop again, bring them in. If you want to go um, down, you just bring them out. And all of that has ended up being really intuitive because if you think about it, if I start falling towards that lectern, what do I do? I put my hand out. If I'm flying this and I feel myself moving to the right, I put my arm out a tiny bit. So again, with the experience of what it's like riding a bike, you don't consciously think of all the movements. This has all become quite second nature. 
just as a side note, the only bit that doesn't seem to be second nature is the rotation. Because you've got so many dimensions you're moving in, rotation is a weird one. That one has taken some conscious learning because for some reason, if you start to rotate this way, logically, you seem to do that, which is really bad because then that makes you go even faster that way. That's the only one motion, and I'm, I'm still trying to work out what that is, why that is. There's some, some innate human um, you know, behavior that as you're rotating this way, I think you go... I think you go to grab that way. You like go to move your arm out, which is fine if you're holding onto something, but not fine if there's thrust coming from it. Anyway, it's pretty fascinating. There's no rule book for all this stuff. We sort of made this up as we went along. Um, I think the next clip is, here we go. This is at Comic-Con. We got invited to go to Comic-Con, which is weird. Um, this is also, the reason I threw this in there is because uh, this is, some, I, I think, some nice maneuverability again in a very tight space. And now you'll notice a subtle difference on the back. There's one big engine. We swapped out the two rear ones for one big one, which itself is more powerful than the pair. And also, like starting vertically, gas turbines, you very rarely find them up on their end. Um, and uh, this one, just in the way it's designed, is now uh, much more comfortable at doing that. Also, the old suit was running at about 800 horsepower. This one's now running at 1,050. So, in fact, that's what you'll see, hopefully, if it all works, which it did this morning. Um, uh, that's what you'll hear and see and feel um, in, in five, ten minutes or so. Um, it's quite a bit of power and it can haul around 40 kilos of fuel as well now, um, which is, we don't tend to run with that much, but uh, you can do in theory. I think we've got my favourite um, clip now. This is just showing you more of the capability. Uh, <laughs> this was drone footage. This, it, it's <laughs> edited to look like I was just scoping the area out, you know, at about 100 foot. That wasn't the idea. So this was uh, the John uh, Hopkins University with the Applied Physics Laboratory with a bunch of Navy SEALs, which was great fun. Uh, and uh, because it was the SEALs, we thought we should go over water. And I hid behind a tree, as you'll see in a minute. So just while this is playing out, <coughs> there's a couple of clips um, after this about where we've actually gone with this. Because, as I said, this started out with this slightly audacious vision. And I suppose just a commitment to have a huge amount of fun in a relatively safe way um, of exploring something that was supposed to be on paper impossible. And it's now grown up into a really quite serious aeronautical innovation business that's um, on the way to go and do one of the TED Talks. Uh, we raised a whole ton of money kind of by accident by flying in a VC's car park that he invited us to go there. That was a, that's a, another story. I'm going to have time to go into that. But now we, we, we're really, I feel like we're really at the beginning of this journey. And I say the core behavior is, apart from safety, is just having fun doing it. We're actually doing some speed tests early next week um, where we're going to start bolting on aerofoil surfaces, in other words, wings, because this is grossly inefficient. It's the most inefficient form of human transport probably ever invented. <laughs> it's four litres of fuel a minute to do this. Um, well, you know, flying around with a 40 kilo Bugatti Veyron is quite thirsty. So if you imagine just like the Sea Harrier, if you start transitioning with decent forward speed into aerofoil lift, you can back those engines off. And fr frankly, if you didn't back the engines off, you're probably going to gradually peel all the skin off your face because th th with that sort of horsepower, you can go well over the speed of sound. So we don't want to do that. That's a very loud, loud audience member in there. Um, uh, but one of the other things that's come along, here we go. I put through these in there quite recently. Um, one of the many avenues we're pursuing here, uh, just because we can, because it's fun, uh, we had our first high net worth kind of billionaire chap from Japan, strangely enough, uh, came over having commissioned his own suit. So that was actually a custom built flight suit for a customer. Now it was based on the original model where you can see there's lots of engines there. It was based on the two rear ones, but I had him over for, um, for uh, what was it, three days and he made really good progress and pretty much got to fly. So there's quite, I quite like this shot because this is me coming in to meet the other suit wearing <laughs> customer. <laughs> two suits. Um, and that's the, the same grotty little but brilliant, very useful Wiltshire farmyard, but this time with a, with a scaffold gantry behind where I basically suspended that billionaire by his nether regions for three days. Uh, and he made awesome progress. Um, yeah, in fact, there's lots of vintages of suits there. There you go, that's the, uh, that's the kit. So, here we go. I think that's probably the end. So, um, uh, as Roland said, uh, we should be, uh, you know, live technology, it's like children and animals, you know, you never quite know what's going to happen, but we've done 37 of these events in 12 countries now, and I literally landed this morning from Australia, having done an event there yesterday, or whatever yesterday means, and three days before then with the Special Forces in Singapore. So we've done lots of these, so it should be fine. Um, if it all runs well, uh, and we're going to keep it short because we sort of fill the whole area full of jet fumes, um, you will experience what you can never from the YouTube clips you might have seen leading up to this. It is a visceral experience feeling the kind of fury of these engines. Um, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, I'll be around, I don't know if we're going to do a Q&A thing now or um, 
Uh, I'll be around anyway. And also, but after the demo, I'm sure we'll get some questions in. But that's a quick walk through the rather mad, yeah, 18-month journey. <laughs> <laughs>